All right, so as we can see here, look at this old horrible wood. Horrible. Horrible. So this is a screen house, and we can see the difference here. Boom. A little better. Halfway, halfway through being done over here. Stairs are horrible. And then a little better over here. Still not the greatest thing in the world, but so my father put this thing up in the yard um, 25 years ago, and uh, it's just a little screen porch. Somebody else's. It was a it was a porch. I <laughs> like that's that's what it was. Um, I still have to replace the screen in this door, and and so here here's the inside. It's it's all right. It's okay. I, I broke that wind chime. So yeah, and, and uh, so the thing about this is that my father put this up in the yard 25 years ago and it has fallen into disrepair. And so I've been working all summer to uh, take it apart and clean it up and uh, replace the boards and put it back together. Because, uh, you know, a thing. So it's like I said, this was just a little porch and then it was, uh, somebody was tearing it off a house and my father moved it into the yard here to make a nice little screened in place for the summer. And uh, so this is my project. And it's nice to have a project. Life isn't always books and video games, right? And the reason I'm showing you this is because uh, we're going to come in here to do a book review in a bit. And uh, while I'm waiting for paint to dry on trim that I have pulled off of here, I also may uh, give one wall a coat of paint before I set up the camera in here. So yeah, we'll talk about the screened-in porch a little later. Yeah, you can see I haven't repainted the beams uh, yet. Because, you know, I mean, interior, exterior, I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why I haven't done that. But anyway, so I'm going to set up a chair and against one of the nicer parts so I have a nice backdrop and uh, the tripod and we'll talk about some books in here today while I'm doing work. I'll see you guys. Hello everybody! It's a vertical sandwich. So if you notice white paint all over me or something that's because I've been working outside. The prelude to this video should be, be talking about the screen house we're in and how I'm painting it and renovating it and things like that. Restoring it I guess. So, um, this is it. This is me in it. This chair is comfortable. I, I bought it at Walmart for 20 bucks or something. So, uh, this is my work outdoors painting hat. Um, it's got paint on it, if you can see that. I don't know. So, yeah, I had to change shirts because I had an old grubby paint shirt that actually said where I work because I got it for free from work. So, it's like my paint shirt. <clears throat> so, uh, what we have is uh, this book right here. Boom. Yes. The Moon is a Harsh mis Mistress by Robert Heinlein. Now, we're going to talk about Heinlein a lot, because as far as Hugo Award winners go, he, he won four times. So, um, I've only read two of what he has, he, has uh, he won for. I read Starship Troopers a long time ago. And then I read this when I started, I think... Um, well, let's talk a little bit, before we actually start a book review... Let's talk a little bit about how this kind of whole thing started. So I was reading presidential biographies in order, and I wanted a break. So what I started doing was reading um, sci-fi novels. And I, I started reading some Isaac Asimov sci-fi novels, because I knew that they were kind of easy, and that they would be kind of relaxed reads. And then I found a list of, like, the greatest sci-fi no novels ever written, and I started reading from that. And then I started noticing that a lot of them were Hugo Award winners. So then, I looked at the list of Hugo Award winners and went, wow, I'm already like a quarter of the way through this list. Maybe I should just pick up this list because it'll have good sci-fi. And so that's the thing I'm doing. <laughs> so that's where we get to The Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Robert Heinlein. So I picked this up, uh, I believe, actually as part of that list of like greatest sci-fi novels. So let's just read the back blurb. Uh, Robert A. Heinlein was the most influential science fiction writer of his era, an influence so large that as Samuel R. Delaney notes, 
Modern critics attempting to wrestle with that influence find themselves dealing with an object rather like the sky or an ocean. He won the Hugo Award for Best Novel four times, a record that still stands. The Moon is a Harsh Mistress was the last of these Hugo-winning novels, and it is widely considered his finest work. It is the, a tale of revolution of the rebellion of the former lunar penal colony against the lunar authority that controls it from Earth. It is the tale of the disparate people, a computer technician, a vigorous young female agitator, and an elderly academic who become the rebel movement's leaders. And it is the story of Mike, the supercomputer whose sentience is known only to this inner circle, and who for reasons of his own is committed to the revolution's ultimate success. So, yeah, this book, uh, wait, do we go inside now? We go inside, like, to read the thing? I don't, um, all I know is I have a bookmark. Um, so I wrote on the inside cover 1967, because this won the Hugo Award for Best Novel in 1967. So, 1967. And I have a little thing, so I have, we're going to go inside and I'm going to read part of The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, if you would be so kind as to humor me with my reading of Robert Heinlein. Um, okay, so, uh, so he winks, he winked lights at me, hello man, what do you know? He hesitated, I know, machines don't hesitate, but remember, Mike was programmed to operate on incomplete data. Lately, he had reprogrammed himself to put emphasis on words, his hesitations were dramatic. Maybe he spent pauses stirring random numbers to see how they matched his memories. In the beginning, Mike intoned, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and hold it, I said, cancel, run everything back to zero, should have known better than to ask wide open question. He might read out entire Encyclopedia Britannica, backwards, then go on with every book in Luna. Used to be, he could read only microfilm, but late 74, he got a new scanning camera with suction cup waldos to handle paper, and then he read everything. You asked what I knew, his binary readout lights rippled back and forth, a chuckle. Mike could laugh with voter, a horrible sound, but reserved that for something really funny, say a cosmic calamity. Should have said, I went on, what do you know that's new? But don't read out today's paper. That was a friendly greeting, plus invitation, to tell me anything you think would interest me. Otherwise, no program. Mike mulled this. He was weirdest mixture of unsophisticated, unsophisticated baby and wise old man. No instincts. Well, don't think he could have had. No inborn traits, no human rearing, no experience in human sense, and more stored data than a platoon of geniuses. Jokes, he asked. Let's hear one. Why is a laser beam like a goldfish? Mike knew about lasers, but where would he have seen a goldfish? Oh, he had undoubtedly seen flicks of them, and were I foolish enough to ask, could spew forth th thousands of words. I give up. His lights rippled. Because neither one can whistle. Okay, so, like, yes, this is about a computer technician who realizes that an artificial intelligence he works on is actually alive and has developed a relationship with it. And then they both get involved in a revolution. Now, um, when we talked about Zelazny's Lord of Light, which should have been the last book review that I did, we talked about how Zelazny likes to mix religion into his stories or mythologies. Uh, if, you, if, if, that's your, if that's your thing, great. Um, if your thing is politics, this is, you want to go to Heinlein. Heinlein's huge for exploring political situations with his science fiction. And one of the things about this book that I really like, and, and, and when we talk about Starship Troopers, first off, I'm going to have to reread it. It's been years since I've run Starship Troopers. But when we talk about it, uh, I didn't like it as much as this book, but um, what Heinlein does is, in this book is explores a revolution of kind of a... It's been, ex it's been described as like a Wild West type environment on the moon, where they're controlled from Earth, but they have their own system of justice, they have their own system of of, of society that's looser and more kind of based around personal responsibility than a structured kind of centralized system that exists on Earth. One of the things that he, uh, Heinlein does very well in this novel, amazingly well, is create a culture on the moon. And this is a thing that we'll, we'll talk about in other sci-fi novels. Like, we'll definitely talk about uh, lunar culture or cultures on other planets being distinct from Earth in other sci-fi novels because it's a common theme. If 
it, it's a natural progression when a character goes, or when a society develops separate from another society, that they will diverge. Human history has taught us this. Of um, Highland's society on the moon has its own dialect, its own way of referring to and dealing with tourists from Earth. It obviously there's lower gravity there, so things have developed differently. Their agriculture is, I believe, underground. Uh, they, they also have, uh, the society is polyamorous and, I believe, uh, matriarchal. So a lot of power in families is, is vested in women. So, uh, and there's also something called, uh, Heinlein also explores something called a line marriage, where marriages are continuous as people die out of them. These polyamorous relationships that span generations that can go on indefinitely. Also, uh, his, as you can tell, like words are left out of sentences. He he does a big, um, he interjects a lot of uh, of dialogue that gives kind of a like a, a Soviet Russian kind of feel to the people here because you've got to remember in 1967 there was no just Russia, there was the USSR, which is a thing I remember and you may not. It depends on how old you are. So, uh, in in that way, you. When I first started thinking about reviewing this book, I started thinking about kind of the October Revolution and Socialist Revolution. But that's not really... I, I actually think that the parallels in this book um, are, are a lot more like the American Revolution, mainly because of, you know, the parent society being distant from the self-contained society, whereas, like, the French Revolution and the October Revolution were internal takeovers of a country, whereas the... American Revolution can be thought of as a, a separation from a parent, right? Um, Heinlein, Heinlein definitely plays with kind of the politics of, of, of independence in society and the individual relationships to their, their government or to, you know, it, regardless of what the government might be, if the government does the parent government a revolution is trying to create or if the government is um, wait, the government a revolution is trying to create or the parent government that a revolution is trying to get away from? It, also, the book is very creative. It, it, the, the way the moon attempts to wage war on Earth is fantastic. And kind of the way people deal with being these rebels against a society that is far older and, you know, way more populated and kind of more organized and in control relying on their separateness from the parent society um, to help them out. Fascinating. Heinlein really does great work with this book. It's, it, it's not a hard read. It's, it's, very, it's very layered and, and worked well, but not plotting. So you're not going to spend you know, a ton of time trying to figure out what's going on or spend an entire afternoon to get through 60 pages. The book is let's let's check it out. Let's let's look at the book. The book is uh, the book is 350, a little more pages long. So not bad for a science fiction novel. When we start dealing with things like the three body problem or Sychean or things like this far longer, they're uh, you know this this is this is a this is a nice casual read. If you're interested in kind of uh, explorations of politics, Heinlein's a good guy for that. Uh, Starship Troopers is I know has been critiqued. Uh, in the past for being kind of hyper-nationalist. Uh, this is not so much. This is kind of the opposite turn. It's, it, it's you know, there there's a lot of discussion. There's some discussion of anarchy in here. So, yeah, I, I, I really, I like The Moon is a Heart's Mistress. I mean, it's, we're, we're starting this off with kind of cute, clear masterpieces. And so you're just going to get a lot of glowing reviews from me. Like, you should read this book. This is a book you should read. Well, that's all fine. Um, but we will uh, again eventually get into books where I just go, I didn't like it. You, you know, if you're if you're completing a list like I am, maybe you got to read it. The, you know, but so there will be harsh criticism in the future, but it won't be for this book because this book is this book is fantastic. This book is an enjoyable read. It didn't lack anything. I cared about the characters. I really liked what happened with them. I cared about the things that happened. I wondered about things. I worried about things. I was amazed at the journey that Heinlein took me on. Good book. Great read. So, I hope you enjoyed my screen house. 
hope you enjoyed my book review. Oh, and uh, this book is available wherever fine books are sold, or you can just order it online like everybody else in the world does now. Because um, it's probably not... <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't know. Are there are, are are there even bookstores anymore? I shouldn't say that. That's a horrible thing to say. So when uh, when we return, we are going to be doing uh, "How Late the Sweet Bird Sang" by Kate Wilhelm. I know because it's sitting right in front of me. I'm going to turn this camera off, flip right around, and just do that. See you guys for that. You take care. Bye, everybody. <laughs>